Well, I want to welcome you to this workshop. Um, and what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be addressing or trying to answer the question, what is a woman of grace doing in the priesthood? Now, you can ask that a couple ways. You can go, what's a woman doing in the priesthood? Or you can ask, wow, what's a woman doing in the priesthood? So there will be uh, different ways to view this question. But I'm asking, come on in, ladies, come on in, sit down. I'm asking this question predominantly to find a better way as brothers and sisters in Christ to, uh, to work together in our homes and in our churches so that we can be better equipped to reach others for Christ. Well, we're going to start out first by looking at the early church. And you're all familiar with the beginning of the early church. You know the story very well of how the Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost and what great phenomenon took place. They started speaking in, tongue, yeah, speaking in tongues. And, but what was unique about this is that Peter, he is preaching the Pentecost sermon. And what he has um, done is he goes back to Joel, a prophet Joel, and he takes the words of Joel and he brings them into that situation where he's preaching. And what he says is, in the last days, excuse me, just a moment, I'm going to switch something here on my screen so I can see it better. Okay, what he says is, what, what Joel had said is that the Holy Spirit, in the last days, the Holy Spirit is going to pour out its spirit on sons and daughters, on old men are going to dream dreams, um, the young men are going to see visions, and even the male and female slaves are going to have the, peer, the Spirit poured out on them. This was a unique thing. But what is interesting here is Joel is living in a time where it's very difficult and hard. There's no doubt for us today, when we look around at culture, we're probably thinking, I wish he would return quickly. I wish there would be some uh, response to what's going on in our world today. And that's typical. Whenever we face uh, challenging times and become unsettled, we look to the future. Now, some of us today, we really don't want, when we think about the last day, we are fearful because we think of God's judgment. But what was taking place in the first century church is this was a time of celebration because God was now again dwelling with his people on earth. That's going to be a key thing here. So it was time to celebrate. When we talk about end times, we're just rather frightened because judgment's going to come. When they're speaking of the last days, it is a time when the Holy Spirit or God is going to be dwelling with his people once again. Luke, Luke records the situation that took place at, um, in Jerusalem when the church began. They had a brief time. Now, we may think it's a long time, but it was about 30, 40 years as they were gathered together in the city of Jerusalem. They had a time of fellowship and unity, and they were working in one accord. That is, uh, men and women were all working in one accord to get the gospel message out, the good news that God is here, the Holy Spirit is here, Jesus is our Messiah, this Jesus who has been crucified, buried, and raised is the Messiah. So persecution comes, so you're familiar, you're, you're familiar with the, uh, Stephen's testimony and Stephen's stoning. And after Stephen's stoning, persecution happened against the people. At that time, there was then going to be this great movement of people. They had to become a people on the move. If you look at history, all through history, you will see that persecution takes the church away from familiar surroundings and pushes it outwards. God's intention is not for us to be in one place where we're always safe and just with one another. In order for the gospel message to get out, we have to move and get out of our comfort zone. History how the church the countries and communities have been, re have been reshaped and, and for good and for bad. Currently, I don't know, I'm sure you're aware, but there is a Netflix um, film called The Human Flow. 
I would recommend watching it. It will break your heart when you see the 65 million people who have been forcibly relocated and displaced from their homeland. Um, so for if you're a woman of grace and you're wondering what to do, there's plenty of work to do right now when you look at that film. It was put together by a Chinese man named A. Wee Wee. I might have messed that up. <laughs> it's, a phenom it's a phenomenal film. Okay, but here they are. They are people on the move. They don't get to stay close together, fellowshipping together, um, loving on one another, and praying together as God changes the world. But what happens? Paul comes along and he gives them a new identity. They are not, they're going to be no longer strangers and aliens, he says. You're going to be members of a new household. Some of these individuals who had followed Christ were probably uh, expelled from their families. Relationships like that had been separated. Paul is saying you're going to come together as uh, members of a new household. But he also so does something else. He says that as this group who are on the move, they're going to be a holy temple. They're going to be the dwelling place for God. Now, think back in your Old Testament um, Sunday school classes. When was God ever, what does that make you think of? It's the tabernacle. When God dwelt in the tabernacle, the tabernacle was this mobile temple. So we now are that temple, a dwelling place for God on the move. Longing for a future day when we can be an established temple. But Peter, Peter comes along, and we all know Peter. He's a bit more realistic and down to earth, isn't he? So he actually tells you, you're a displaced believer. He recognizes that they are strangers far from home. They're scattered into unfamiliar places and to peculiar cultures. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had to move four or five different times into completely different areas of the world and the United States. Each move took me, took a while to adjust to that. But as a, and so you have different cultures, different foods, different ways of thinking, uh, from Denver's a completely different place to live than a small town in Missouri. So there are ma major changes that happens. But Peter recognizes that as well. And Peter says, in spite of being outside of your familiar surroundings, in spite of being in places where you're going to stand out as different, in spite of in places where your culture is going to try to squeeze you to be like them, and you're going to want to be like them because you want fellowship. He says, you need to remember to be holy. Why? We need to be holy. You need to be holy as the displaced church on the move. You need to be holy because I, God, am holy. Okay. So the people on the move, the church on the move, received a new identity as a holy nation, a priesthood of believers, in order to offer spiritual sacrifices. That's all priestly language. That's all language that takes us back to the Old Testament at the time when the Israelites were working with the priestly system. So Peter found purpose from that first century, for the first century human flow. And when you watch the film and you think, what was it, 30 some, that large amount of number of people moving, when you think of the Israelite people moving, and as the church on the move, and we give it a new dynamic of the, the human flows, the ancient priesthood. That's where Peter gets this concept. He goes to the Old Testament, he goes to Exodus predominantly, and he gives new meaning for the human flow. So when you look back to the Old Testament, we find a purpose for that priesthood. What was the purpose for Israel? In Exodus, God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh seven different times, let my people go so that they may worship me. Let my people go so that may, they may worship me. Seven times he goes to Pharaoh and seven times he's turned down. So God's purpose for rescuing 
the nation, the, the people of the Hebrews who were in captivity in Egypt and were now working as slaves, um, God's purpose was to bring them out as a people to be his nation so that they could worship him. But worshiping him was not enough. Worshiping him and setting him apart was not going to be all that God required of them. He wanted them also to be holy. He said, I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You should be holy because I am holy. God wants, God is in relationship with us and he wants the people to be holy as well as, as much as he is holy. But that's also not it. So he wants them to worship him only. He wants them to be holy and be set apart as a holy people. But the the other purpose is for them to be a blessing wherever they go. This comes straight from the promise given to Abraham. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing, so others will worship the one true God. With, with, when, the, when, the, when the Israelite people came to Mount Sinai, Moses' his father-in-law was a Midianite priest. And... He, he became fully aware of, well, all the nations around became very aware of what God, the mighty works that God had done. And this Midianite priest came to know the God of Israel and ended up in fellowship with, with uh, the people of Israel. So what's a woman of grace then to be, to be in the priesthood? We, we know from the people in Israel, they are to worship, they're to strive for holiness, and they're to be a blessing. But what is the purpose going to be for a woman of grace, grace in this new priesthood that um, is established? Well, she's to tell her story. I found this to be very interesting. As Christ followers, we are witnesses and we declare the praises of God. He, we are to be, we're to tell the story of how God has taken us out of darkness, just as he took the Israelites out of this dark 400 years of misery as slaves in Egypt. We are to tell our story. So a woman of grace tells her story. But that is not all she does. She is to be transformed. Do you start seeing this sort of a pattern here? We are taken out of darkness, and then we're going to be transformed. And in that transformation, we are renewing our mind, and we are renewing our body. And what is that going to do for us? That's going to create in us a holiness that draws us to be more like God, who wants us to be more in His image. But she is not just to be worshiping, I mean, telling her story. She's not just to be transformed. She's also to be a blessing to those around her. Um, J.K. Smith writes in Desiring the Kingdom, and I kind of play with this, she lives as a counterformation to the misinformation, well, misformation and the misinformation of our secular liturgies. There are rituals that, we part that many around of us participate on a daily basis. There are rituals that we participate in on a daily basis that form us and shape us and uh, sometimes deform us. So as a woman of grace, we are to know God's word so that we can be a blessing in our culture, we're in our communities to reshape that. I'll also warn about something in the last days. Now, here we have, they're in the last days. They're rejoicing in the last days. God is here with them. But now Paul sort of throws a damper on all of this. What do you mean there's gonna be uh, uh, more uh, damage coming along the way? So he will give this warning. There's going to come a time when people will be ungrateful, unholy, inhuman. It's a long list. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. Now that was first century. It's definitely not happening in our century, is it? So thank goodness that they must have gone through it and weathered it, right? We're here. If you look back through history, every generation can take these scripture, the scripture and see themselves going through a time that is dark like this. So that, this, the, what, the, what the world is offering is this counterfeit humanity. 
It forms us into something that is not what God had intended for us to be. Definitely not in the image of God. There are going to be those then who forbid marriage and demand abstinence from food. Now this was a counterfeit path to holiness. It's this way of, if I could just beat my body, if I can just deprive myself of enough things, if I can, uh, and they, go, they went to extremes in the first and second centuries, um, in order to strive to become perfect, not necessarily holy, but it was this path of perfection, a path that gets you on a journey to get to this perfect soul or perfect person. Um, so they, they did this on, a, on a, a, a deep level. But people would also then follow after deceitful spirits, demonic teachings, and would seek after ancient myths. So what we have here then is counterfeit God stories. They're all around us. The first century, from the first to the third centuries, they had them. False gospels, pseudo gospels, novels, about Paul and another woman. We've got the stories of Mag, uh, Mary Magdalene, just all sorts of uh, false stories. So we've got a counterfeit humanity, a counterfeit path to holiness, and a counterfeit God stories. As a woman of grace, we have to be able to recognize that so we can counter it. But Paul also said there would be a unique attack against women. There were teachers in that day who would worm their way into homes, gain control of weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins, swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning, gathering together, bringing in teachers, probably teachers that, you know, tickled their ears, but teaching without ever arriving at a knowledge of the truth. The NIV translates that as, as weak-willed women, other passages say silly women. Silly women, I don't think really captures. That just seems to be more of an immature um, teenage girl who hasn't really quite arrived at adulthood. But a weak-willed woman probably captures the image of what Paul is trying to communicate here. This is a woman who is, doesn't have the ability to know the truth and to stand against the false teachings. So a weak-willed woman is easily deceived but we know that the grace-filled woman is in contrast to that. She knows the truth. She knows it so well that she can stand and speak the truth boldly. This is your grace-filled women. So even in this age, our current age, of newfound female freedom, I mean, I came back from Europe in 76 to the feminist movement in full swing where we were radically freed from the shackles of our past. Um, but here we are. I don't want to count the years how far later. But here we are later, and I still look around, and women are still struggling in spite of that, struggling with their identity, with their body, with what does, what's the purpose in life? What's my purpose? So I, I believe... We're at this place because we have three conflicting views of humanity that seem to just continue to bump into um, each other throughout time. The first comes from Plato. These are, ancient, these are views, these first two, Plato and Aristotle. These are views, let me back up. Human, men and women have been trying to figure themselves out for hundreds of years. We don't seem to have ourselves figured out. Um, I have a scholar who has, uh, I have books from this female scholar. She's been working on this, her research from 1975 till now, and she's traced the philosophical views from 700 BC to 2015. And the, the gamut of how they're trying to figure out why are we women so different than men? and how to define us because they don't know what to do with us. Now granted there were women also asking the same questions but not as many female uh, writings were um, preserved. So we're going to just only look at two because these are, these are ideas of humanity that seem to pervade and continue to influence our way of thinking. 
and we don't know it, and we don't even know it. Okay, so the first, Plato, a human being, just a human person, is a pre-existing unsexed soul trapped in an earthly gendered body that struggles, this unsexed soul is pre-existing and it's in this body and it's struggling to get itself out because it's going through reincarnation stages. And so at one point in life I could be, I'll be a woman, which is an inferior place to be. Because in order to attain this state of perfection, the soul has to escape and go through another journey through life and hopefully come back as a man because, into, I mean not as a man, into a man's male body because then he can work, uh, the soul can work its way back to its perfect state which is pre-existing. Okay, so I hope you're catching some of those ideas there that are counter to what we understand. Now Aristotle, who studied under Plato, he comes along and he's quite a bit uh, harsher. He's quite a bit harsher. Plato, Plato would say um, just a man and a woman, they're kind of equal because they're not really a male and a woman, a man and a woman. They're kind of just stuck in that body so you can relate to each other as equals. Aristotle, on the other hand, absolutely not. The woman is a male-formed human. She's a, and she is only used to procreate. She is irrational. She's inferior. She's emotional. So the only way for the perfect man to resolve that problem is to insist that she obeys men, that she remains silent, and that she stays out of the public sphere. Where have you heard any of that? Okay? So those are two, two concepts that keep repeating themselves, and I honestly believe some of the Platonic thought is unwittingly behind some of our gender confusion. All right? So, plus I believe Aristotle's view that we are lesser human contributes to our own shame as a woman. But we have, thank goodness, the biblical view, which is Adam, which is the word for humanity until we become Adam and Eve. Adam, as a, the whole humanity, is created as gendered persons in the image of God. It's not a matter of one's better than the other because we are created in the image of God. Okay, so we're either an unsex soul trying to get out of a gendered body, we're either half a person because we're a woman and not a perfect person like the man, or we are actually imaging God. Which one are you? Okay, so we have women at risk continuing to be at risk in society. Our popular novels and the media dehumanize us. Our bodies are measured against the bodies of celebrities. And to be honest, I measure my body against other women's bodies. And I wish I could be flatter here. And, you know, we all want something different. Um, domestic violence and sexual assault continues on a global scale, unprecedented global scale. And one of women's primary work, because a lot of us, how many of you are mothers in here? Okay. Not all women are, but, and not all women want to be, and that is fine, but that primary work where children are raised in the home is, falls a lot on women. But that is also very devalued in, on an international scale. So let's see if this works. Can you feel that? <laughs> so I believe there's a better way. Many, of, many, as I've said earlier, we've unknowingly mixed the ancient philosophical views of humanity um, to interpret our biblical views of humanity. This, is, this may explain why, then, we end up having married and single women who are committed to ministry being devalued, diminished, and dismissed. It may explain why we have single moms who still struggle to raise their children on their own. 
It may explain why we have women who endure abuse at the hands of their pastors and their clergy. It may also explain why religious leaders continue to exploit weak women. I think there is a, a remedy. There is a remedy for this, for women at risk. Men and women of grace must work side by side to resolve this. You see the remedy there? We have to be working together. We're, not to, we're to be allies, our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. The biblical view of Adam, of woman and man. After putting man in the Garden of Eden to till and keep it, God said, it's not good for man that man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. Now, I want us to think about, when we think about Eden or the Garden of Eden, you may be like I, think of a beautiful pastoral scene, uh, a garden, a little literal green space where they're going to be farming together. But there's a whole lot more going on in Genesis than just being a green garden space. It is a sacred space. It is a space where God is dwelling. Where does God dwell? What did we learn about? What was Paul saying? God dwells in our holy temple. We are the holy temple. God was dwelling in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is like a temple in the world. So Adam and Eve are going to be functioning side by side in a priestly role in the Garden of Eden. And we all know the story. They fail and they are expelled. They are sent eastward out, they are sent eastward out from the garden. The entrance into the garden is on the east side. They are sent eastward. Eastward means they are walking away from the place where God dwells. So if Adam, filling his priestly role, needed Eve as a partner to accomplish that priestly role, I argue that leaders today, male leaders in the church today, need women by their side to accomplish that work, or the Sisters of Grace by their side. Okay, the Bible has a high view of women, no matter what some of us have been led to believe, that we're devalued and the Bible doesn't really highly regard us. Uh, Paul in Corinthians um, tells the women that, well, he says, do you not know that you, plural, women, are also um, are God's temple and that the Spirit dwells in you? Do you not know that your, a plural your, body is a temple, sanctuary of the Holy Spirit? So. He's not writing to just men. Women and men together form the temple of God here on earth. So home, women are at risk in Christian homes as well. <coughs> home is the first place we learn about God's grace or not. Um, wives and daughters are still dehumanized in homes. We know many of our Christian friends who come from homes like that. Female bodies are misconstrued and women misunderstand the word, the meaning of submission. So when distorted doctrines collide with religious power, women are shamed, they are exploited, and they ultimately lose. I'm gonna share just a, a brief story here from my own past. My childhood home was broken, not by divorce or desertion, but it was a malfunctioning home nonetheless. I share one memory because it reveals why I am passionate about rightly understanding God's word for women today. The five of us were in our preteen years by now. Dad called a meeting around the table in the kitchen where a large green chalkboard hung on the wall, the kind that we used at country school. Yes, I went to country school. On this occasion, a number of expenses had been tallied in a column on the board. Mom was called to give an account for her poor budgeting skills. Her every response was discounted and attributed to her financial ineptitude. The pitch continued to rise in the room as Dad circled each item one by one before checking them off. Wrong. Wrong. Ranting and raving ensued, but her guilt needed to be dealt with. The only way to resolve her infractions was that she must kneel next to the kitchen chair and audibly pray for God's forgiveness. She obligingly obeyed. As the head, he was her supreme power source. He demanded she pray repeatedly until he determined which of her prayers revealed that she was truly penitent. I remember that day because I was fuming inside. 
I wondered why she wouldn't challenge him, why she wouldn't stand up for herself, why she wouldn't stand up for her daughters, one brother and four daughters. But I was plenty angry at him also. I yelled out, I cried out, you're not God. What are you trying to do? You're not God. But I realized then and there that I was actually angrier and more ashamed of my mother. It was at this point that I discovered being female was a shameful thing. That female meant weakness. I was too young to know how easy it was to exploit that shame to control another person. When a woman is shamed, she is unable to help herself and unable to help others. So what I want, what we're going to kind of close with as we prepare for our clo closing here is to look at the Proverbs 31 woman as an image for us today as grace-filled women, okay? This woman, the opening, the opening of Proverbs 31.10 begins with a mighty warrior who can find. That's not right, is it? We don't re usually hear it as a mighty warrior. Um, you, we kind of think of it's going to be more about the ideal housewife, or, uh, but certainly not the, weak, the meek wallflower. So this comes from, this is not my, uh, my research here. This comes from a woman, Jewel McGee, and I heard her speak a couple weeks ago at a Society of Biblical Literature conference. And I tell you, by the time she was finished with her whole presentation, I was about ready to do an altar call, altar call because it was fantastic. So this is her research. The Proverbs 31 woman is a warrior. She's a mighty warrior. She prepares for battle. She girds her loins with power and gives strength to her arms. Both of those are images of preparing for war. She first covers her own shame. Because if we're shamed women, we can't help anyone. We're not good mothers. We're not good wives. We're not good friends. We're just naked and exploited. So we have to first cover our own shame. And how do we do that as women of grace? We know we go to Christ. So she clothes herself first, and then she works to cover the shame of other women and all other peoples who are near and far. She and her husband work together as allies. She's also a woman who has influence that reaches across the globe. She works with the least and greatest members of society. And how does she do this? Her strength is found in the Lord, not in any vaporous beauty that fleets as we get older. She doesn't have her confidence in trying to reshape and redesign her body so that she can keep her spouse or her significant other. Her strength comes from the Lord. So a woman of grace, I'll read this last little bit. This comes from my experiences back when we were living in Vienna. We traveled behind the Iron Curtain and worked with uh, the Christians who were uh, trapped behind the Iron Curtain in the times of the communist era. In the first part of our co-ministry, we served Christians behind the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe, back in the day when walls were seen as the problem and not the solution. This experience has forever impacted my worldview. Just a tidbit here of information. In 1989, there were only 11 countries around the world with borders and walls. By 2016, 70 countries have built fences around their fences and walls. So one, on one of our trips to Hungary, we stayed in the home of an elderly couple. Imagine in your mind a babushka-like woman her head covered with a brightly colored scarf, and her face creased from years of surviving two world wars and the Soviet invasion of 1956 in her country. I have a vivid memory of her dining room table. On the crochet tablecloth, her, her Bible laid open alongside other study books. She had enrolled in a correspondence course of sorts in a country that did not allow religious material. We smuggled in religious material because it was contraband in that time here, time. But she's boldly has her stuff out there on the table. But she's not sitting at the table. She's hustling about preparing meals of buttered thick bread, sliced vegetables for a ministry group of six. I remember watching and thinking, 
I want to be that kind of woman someday. I don't remember her name. Brother Tamar, our Jewish Christian contact who had survived the concentration camps, made arrangements for us to stay at her hostel. This woman exhibited a boldness and a daring in an era of extreme religious persecution, and she reminded me of the Hebrew midwives that I read about in my childhood, who were also living under a repressive government. When I'm tempted to despair because of financial, political, or social crises, she pops into my mind, reminding me that women of grace are equipped as women of strength to face whatever comes their way. So, a woman of grace, she is far above rubies. Whether single or married, wherever she may live, working from home or from an office, working in the fields or in a factory, confined to her bed or in a wheelchair, or found even standing behind a pulpit. A woman of grace fears the Lord, stands for truth, builds her house where all are welcome, seeks justice and salvation for humanity near and far. So tell me, what are you, a woman of grace, doing in the priesthood? Thank you.